Hi everyone, I'm Cheryl McNeil Fisher. Dr. Kathy King and I want you to know you are important to us. We are thrilled that you're here with us today for another episode of Writing Works Wonders. Welcome to Writing Works Wonders. We're so pleased you're with us for this exciting episode as we interview science fiction author Stephen Thiberge. Stephen is a graduate of the Perkins School for the Blind and already has published three books. We know this will be a fabulous, exciting episode. So buckle up, Buttercup. We are getting ready to explore the intergalactic world of writing with your bibliophile friends at Writing Works Wonders. I'm Dr. Kathy King, and I'm so pleased to introduce you to my fabulous co-host, Cheryl McNeil Fisher. Hey, Kathy, and how appropriate, because you're the master of the universe during this (laughs) sci-fi day. (laughs) Hi, everyone. For the sake of our guest and interview, we will read the responses to the prompt at the end. Back to you, Kathy. Okay. I'll provide a little bit of a background about our guest. Stephen was born in Lewiston, Maine, and moved as a child to Attleboro, Massachusetts. He attended Perkins School for the Blind, where he's a graduate, and then he went on to Rhode Island College and graduated in computer science and also English. As an entrepreneur, he has worked in developing computer software for the visually impaired. In addition to his writing, he now also is a usability tester and an ADA compliance tester. Stephen has published three science fiction books and is working on his fourth. Two of these books are already available on BARD for those that use the BARD system. Stephen's webpage is available at dldbooks.com slash Stephen Theberge. We're pleased to have him on Writing Works Wonders. Over to you, Cheryl. Welcome. We're so glad you're here with us. Stephen, as we get started, the first thing, would you please spell your name so people will understand and get it correct? And we'll, we'll, we'll repeat this again at the end for your website. Yeah, that's Stephen with a P-H, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Feeburge, T-H-E. B-E-R-G-E. Thank you. When did you first get interested in writing? Then how did it evolve to writing fiction? My books came from childhood ideas of science fiction. I wrote some of these in college. So it took many years. So I've always been a writer to some degree or another. So I, I think it was just in my blood. I've always liked writing. I don't think there was a date. I, I think part of it was it's like the school was like, I'm gonna write an essay. It's like now, and it's like now I want to be an author. I don't think there was one day, but I I do remember some of the ideas from my stories came as a child, and some of them came in college, and I kind of later put them all together. So it, probably forever, I was born a writer. So when did you make the decision that you wanted to write a story to be published? In the early two thousands, I was saying to myself, I want to autobiography. I said, I don't know about that. Everyone does blind autobiographies. I want a science fiction story. I kind of combined it. So I would say roughly in the early 2000s, I was seriously sitting down and pulling these ideas together as to say being published. Yeah. Yeah. How do you think science fiction contributes to literature? I I always thought science fiction was always, I, I guess I grew up the time I grew up, we had Lost in Space and Star Trek and kind of it was new to the general public. Of course, science fiction has been around forever. I, I just thought it was far out. It was it was very imaginative, but it, it, it was just something I just gravitated to. And thanks to my dad, God bless him. He, he supported me and, and he was not a sci fi fan. He was like, oh, you really eat that up. huh?" It's like. But he, he was very supportive of me as, and there, there is some sci-fi that is like out there, but I, I just think now it's much more acceptable than it used to be. But back mm-hmm. in the day, it was like, you know, 
established like Star Trek, uh, Lost in Space, Flash mm-hmm. Gordon. You know, you can go way back. H, of mm-hmm. course, the classic sci-fi writers. So it did, it just to me was a natural thing, and it was just let the imagination go a little further than other genres. Although that's just the way I took it. I think it's I think it's great. Me, I I could write about fairies and little things, but to get into the sci-fi, my favorite Martian. Now that's really back. <laughs> yeah, well, that's... back over to you, Kathy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, reminds me of ET. Yeah, with his little <laughs> finger. <laughs> so, Stephen, so great to have you here on the show. One of the things that I'm really pleased about with your sci-fi and that I'm trying to do as well, and some authors do this in the sci-fi genre, but not too many, is write about marginalized and underrepresented groups in our society. So not just aliens and creatures that we don't know about, but people in our society who are marginalized and underrepresented, and you've included those groups in your works. Can you tell us who you've included that fall into those categories? Well, of course, disability, blindness, visually impaired. I think sci-fi has always kind of done that, although I, I kind of take a more real people with disabilities, sexuality, I dive into. I also, in my first book, dove into racism and how our parents were maybe not overt racist, but where racism comes from. And then there's just the oppressed people that are bullied. There's no reason. They were just oppressed because a bully just happened to pick someone out and say, I'm going to bully you. They wasn't even, they were marginalized because a bully was allowed to get away with it. So I kind of, I kind of put all those things together. And when it comes right down to it, we're all marginalized in some one way or another. And we're, we all feel left out. You know, we all want to be included in something. But it's it's a lot easier when you grow up as, well, I wouldn't say easier, but, you know, you have a disability or you're a different skin color or you have a different sexual orientation. Those, those are very obvious kind of things. So then, of course, you could say, well, they're aliens. And someone said to me once, um, oh, you you can't use the word alien in your book because it's going to offend foreigners. I said, well, you can't be much more of a foreigner if you're an alien. I mean, <laughs> and then there's that political correct it's a way to way do we draw that line but yeah marginalization is part of it's how how we feel but i think you know you look at disability sexual orientation unfortunately racism still is th- those are the main ones i think and, and like i said the oppressed someone's bullied just because they're just marginalized because they're bullied there's really no reason for it absolutely i re- really get into my second book and the character in my second book was abuse so she comes out and says i'm gonna give that back to the Mm -hmm. whole world that's a clear theme in that second book and and the the first book you're also in both books that are on bard you're also dealing with drug issues dealing with a lot of societal issues that um, is typical of sci-fi interweaving Mm -hmm. those and that'll be part of my next question but you know to your point about racism Uh, Very often, sometimes like Star Trek, they dealt with it clearly as racism, but very often in science fiction, it's xenophobia, being really afraid of the other, the alien, uh, something entirely foreign. And you bring it closer to home into people that are in our society. And I just don't see that many characters in sci-fi who are visually disabled that have blindness and also who are gay. I I find that very refreshing in your work to see those folks depicted and how they navigate the world of the future. So I, I thank you for that, for bringing that to us. How do you seek to balance, you know, sci fi is this dance. You're trying to reach into the future, but yet you have to stay connected to reality enough so that your reader can stay connected to you and not just put the book down and go, I don't know what he's talking about. Do you have a concept of how you do that dance and try to navigate that distance? Well, yeah, I mean, I I think the whole issue is characters. It doesn't really matter what the genre is as much as even if the the aliens, 
we want to relate to these characters. What you know? What are their struggles? What are their feelings? It's not so much about saying it's sci-fi. Yeah, you can talk about other planets. You can talk about all kinds of technical things. But I always thought it was more about the characters and saying, you know, how does this relate to me as, as a person? You know, what if this happened to me? So I I don't see it as a lot of people say. Well, sci-fi is out there, but I don't care what you're writing about. If it's romance, if it's um, fantasy, if it's a Western, it's the characters that bring the story. So the rest, the rest is just decoration. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. Character is a critical part. And your comments are right on target there. I think that'll be helpful for a lot of folks to, to hear that. Did I hear you say that you felt that you were putting together a little bit of autobiography with what you were writing about in your early books? Oh, absolutely. Um, we, we had a lot of, there's a lot of contention there. I mean, it's no secret now, but I, I use first names, no last names. And someone came and said, you can't care, especially in the second book, someone, someone actually came to me and said, do you want to, this Padma character is, because they, they were there in the real world, but obviously I embellished it. And I said, if I changed the name, you would have still known who I was talking about. I think a lot of writers do. It doesn't matter if it's sci-fi, you know, we do write what we know and we mm -hmm. often turn a character into a villain or, you know, and it's so, okay, we'll fictionalize it. But someone said, well, why aren't you going to get in trouble for using that name? I said, not really. Oh, the only reason you know is because you were at the same, there at the same time in the same place. If I had changed it to a guy's name, you would have still known who I was talking about. So I think most writers probably write, you know, you can change it all up a million ways, but they're going to write about think people and things they know. And it's just mm -hmm. a matter of how you present it. I think that what you've done is in those early books, because I haven't read the third one in the first two books, you've melded together education for people who are cited about what it's like to live as blind and what it's like to go through the, the learning curve. You talk about voc rehab, maybe not in those specific words, close to it. And yet it's in an entertaining way. And I think people would in this group would be very surprised that that's interwoven into a science fiction book. At the same time, we need to mention to, to this group that your books do have a sensitivity to them that they're very much for an adult audience. Yeah. And so there's that aspect to these books. We do want to mention that. Thanks so much, Stephen. Cheryl? You started to ask a, uh, answer about the characters. Where do you get the background for your characters? And I think you started talking about that. Most of them are from what you know and what you've lived or a good combination of both imaginative and real life yeah i mean there are characters in especially in the first book that's probably a lot more autobiographical in the second book i took more liberties and characters that are not at all earth-based it's just human characteristic you know is this a good person mm -hmm. is this a bad person or is this person doesn't know who they are good or bad and mm -hmm. you know so I, I just think a lot of my characters and a lot of what i write about is from what I other things I read and you're trying trying to balance out I don't want it to be like a literature thing it's like well we have an archetypal mm -hmm. I, that means like this this is a demon and this is a hero it's like that's nice when when you read about it in college but I, I like to be more like reachable to like someone can relate to it like people have told me it's like it wasn't even about the sci-fi it's just I like your book because you know they, they never read sci-fi and they're like liking the story mm -hmm. I think because it's, it's the characters and the interactions and what's going on more than it being about science fiction. When I'm trying to write sometimes, I can write through dogs and, and animals. I can write children's books. I can write for other people. But I am still struggling with books for adults and finding that way because everything inside of me is is about what I know and getting into that imaginative world to be able to combine the two. I, I'm just in awe of authors who take what they know and are able to put it in this imaginative fiction world. But someone else had told me that this is 
this would be a great, because I know someone that wrote a book about going to a blind school and it was very emotional. You know, they mentioned, this is what we did. And this, I said, you're going to talk about how you felt and what, mm-hmm. how you react. So I, right. but it wasn't my, but yeah, I, I think they, they use that catharsis. It's kind of like, especially mm-hmm. my second book, that evil character. I did, I just got that mm-hmm. out of my system. I, it was a bad experience with one person mm-hmm. and good mm-hmm. people too. You, you can turn that mm-hmm. them into heroes, but it's a fantasy land. You can do whatever you want. If, if it does educate people, I think it's mm-hmm. great because mm-hmm. it, it's, it's not so much saying to me, it's like saying this, this is who I am. This is how people are. So you educate people by just showing what we do. We, we do this. Mm-hmm. It's not mm-hmm. saying it's about blindness. It's not saying right. I'm a disabled superhero. Like, you know, you were talking about that earlier. It's like, I don't want those superpowers or we don't, you know, right. that, that wouldn't have worked. Mm-hmm. And like you said, you're making, it's identifiable or people relate to it. Can identify it, it, Kathy? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's a really good perspective. So your first two books, what are the names of the first two books? The first one is Metchi, M-E-T-S-C-H-E, which there's basically, if we had a Mars had life. So these two, these two, it was two races in a solar system, Metans and Shenans, that's what, and so they mm-hmm. formed an alliance, This they're 50,000 years ahead of us, evolutionary, so they formed an alliance, they, they almost destroyed each other 50,000 years ago, so they go exploring the universe, and we just happen to be, Earth just happens to be the first race they find, so oh, human, you know, they found bacteria, maybe even animals, they, oh, we, this this is a humanoids, oh, this is wonderful, so they, they kind of were a little, went a little off the rails, and they kind of admired us, so then they decided, what are we? Gonna, how are we going to help these people? Can uh, we don't want to interfere? But they have a lot of problems here. So the Metri message, which is basically giving the message to the Andre in the first book to say, you know, we how are we going to help intervene with Earth? And then the second one is Metri Maelstrom. So what happened in this? These two races wanted to combine the best of both races, so they thought, and they hybridized, or they co-mated and it didn't quite work out the way they expected some of these people were or aliens were rogues or they had bad qualities they had bad tempers they were a little psychotic some of them so <laughs> a little in the second <laughs> in the second book <laughs> this evil alien padma is a drug addict and she mm-hmm. her her drug addiction she believes in these her prophecy is to rule earth because she was an abused child and she said, okay, don't gonna... give away too much. Don't no, give but away I, too much. It's, it's in the synopsis. It's, it's in the synopsis. Okay. But, but I'm not, <laughs> not going to say any more, but that's her message, mission. So these books one and two are, you know, they go in order. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I'm not going to give it, definitely not going to give it away. But that's where we come to the second book where it's like, and that's basically we were talking about marginalized amongst two amongst the two races because these two races so oh let's let's improve the races and you know it's like saying we had somebody on mars and earth and said well, well we can make make a better race and these these people or aliens are marginalized because they're considered rogues or and they don't have any rights in the council meshi council which is basically they decide how are we going to intervene with other races what are we going to do on the earth so so those very people they created are marginalized in their own society it's kind of like biracial. You could look mm-hmm. at it that way. And then what's the title of your third book that you're waiting to get into Bard? The Mechi Meridian. Now, what that is. Meridian. Okay. I don't want to give it all away, but I, I will say in in the second book, when, when some of those rogues escape and try to find a planet to go to. Oh. With 50,000 years in the future, and they develop in by lucid dreaming the ability to travel back in time. So they're like, can we fix, can we fix all? So these three books are all got to be read in order. I don't know if you could didn't, you'd be confused. So they go back and say, how are, what are we going to do about Padma? What are we going to do about interference? Should we have interfered? And they, there's different scenarios in the third book about time okay. travel. And so I, I thought it was unique because, you know, they didn't have a time machine. It was just a natural ability because they were on a certain planet and they were like, 
lucid and it's, these children are disappearing in their sleep and they come back and say, oh, I was, and, and a kid brings back something from 10,000 years ago and it's like, oh, these people are really traveling in time. Are you hooked, Cheryl? Are you hooked? <laughs> I'm sure you. Oh got yeah, yeah. I, I'm still, I'm still back at where he, where you <laughs> said, Stephen, about how you had the one villain you described, it, and it was from an experience with someone in your past, and then you, you let that go, or you got over it. And I'm talking, <laughs> that's amazing. I, I'm still, I'm still there at that part. <laughs> so, <laughs> of if, course, if I'm anyone, for the others. <laughs> if anyone had a bad experience in their past, and you could say, yeah. could I go back and fix something? Now, those, so that's when I get into this time travel because they're like 50,000 uh-huh. years in the future and say, well, what if the aliens didn't? And then I, and I get into, I don't like, again, I'm not going to give a lot away, but what if I get mm. into this thing about so, some of the blindness had to do with alien intervention and mm. some of it, it uh-huh. gets really interesting. Mm. And cool. Oh, different, we different, can't wait it, to read that one. Well, it, it's, yeah, out, it's actually, it's actually mm. out. It's on, it's on Amazon. It's just not on It's on Amazon. Yet. Okay. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. That's on it. I'm waiting for books mm-hmm. here. I don't know what's taking them so long for the third mm-hmm. one, but they're all on, on Amazon. And actually, Alexa is not a bad reader. I know I'm mm-hmm. not, and I'm not getting paid to say that by Amazon. <laughs> no, and Nikki, <laughs> Nikki on Siri is on my iPhone oh. using Nikki. She's, oh, yeah, she does a great job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of yeah. So all three books are on Amazon. You know, if you go mm-hmm. to that website. So you can mm-hmm. read them there. And, and I, I do like my reader on, on Bard. Mm-hmm. And the third one is in process. Excellent. What I feel you are doing by having this discussion is sparking imagination and mm-hmm. opening up different ways that we can write if we're stuck or thinking about, well, what if we go back and change it? You know, we've had so many different discussions here on Writing Works Wonders. And today I just feel like you've resonated with me a lot and struck mm-hmm. some different thoughts and i appreciate that we understand you're working on a fourth book the mm-hmm. fourth book is at my editor as we it's been there for yeah it's it's finished it just has to be edited it's a novella it's just the shortest thing i ever wrote any spoiler alert or basics on that or it, your working title fourth book is going to call be called andre's caregiver Mm. So Andre is a character. It's it's totally different than the first three books because it's ten years in the future from about now. But I basically deal with robotics and what if we couldn't tell robots from humans or androids? I should say it gets very interesting. And what if androids can do criminal acts and we don't know who's who? And it's you know it's, it goes way beyond the chat GBT. That's what inspired me with this, and I was thinking kicking that around for a long time, and I just got it done and i was like this is going to be hopefully get me on the map because it's kind of uh, one of those topics that everyone was talking about artificial intelligence and android well not so much android androids but it's like what if your partner was an android and you didn't know it or what if (laughs) someone someone committed a crime as well an android committed a crime we we can't trace to who that android belongs it does a lot of things that can happen if we got that level i love this Stephen, because you're depicting the role of science fiction in literature and society to take the what if questions, to take the controversial issues, work them out in another universe or space for people to see where they could extend to and to work on society, you know. Yeah, um, and I said on that COVID theme, we had uh, 10 years in the future, 75% mortality rate, it, it has dysentery it's more and a lot of people are dying so they had to make androids to to fill in for the losses you know we thought mm. COVID, it makes covid look like you know oh that's just that's just a little you know you just have a little cold go home but this this is like when when 75 percent of the world population is wiped out that that's that's sci-fi in my book that that's really mm-hmm. to me and what would we do and of course coincidence it's like well somebody had a breakthrough in computer science and androids and they're really smart and they can really do all this stuff. And then what? There you go. Yeah. That that's the role of sci fi for society to to work out the the benefits, the failures, the the what ifs. Chanel? Yes, we have a question from Deanna. 
I have difficulty writing about people that might be recognized because I'm a very tender-hearted person. <laughs> and one of the things that I have, the reason I write a lot, but I haven't had a lot published except scattered all over the place in, in newsletters and small magazines and things, is that if I come too close to the bone, my, my mother is 92 and she would be really hurt if she knew some of the things that happened to me as I was growing up. Um, so I tend to soft pedal stuff and then I'm afraid it's not real. I did write an autobiography um, for her 90th birthday and I included a lot of stories and poems about my guide dogs because that was a safe topic because even though she was afraid of dogs, she felt I needed a dog to go to college because she wouldn't be there. My brothers and sister wouldn't be there. I'd be off in an alien world, literally, because I'm Native American. So going off to college in 1968, when my long hair and moccasins, I was taken mistaken for a flower child when I was a master sergeant's daughter from the res who was brought up very strictly with the idea that, okay, so you're blind. That means you can't wait tables, mm -hmm. you can't pump gas. You've got to, to use your brain. So you're going to college. And that was my mother's plan from the time that she figured out that I was going to be blind. You know, so, so a lot of the stuff, some of the stuff I put in my book even caused my brother to be distressed. And he said, I just can't read it, it hurts. And it was, you know, relatively things that didn't have anything to do with him. It was things that happened in college and stuff. So I don't know how you handle that dichotomy, because if I put a lot of the painful stuff, to me, it's like opening wounds and bleeding all over again. And I've chosen to say that was then, this is now. I don't, I don't need to bleed for you. The reader i'll take you on adventures but i can't i can't deal with some of the painful sad stuff any thoughts about that stephen oh absolutely we i've discussed this about offending others um i actually had my book had an audible reader on my first book and they they wanted to abridge it i i really didn't have any graphic stuff about but they were like, didn't want the stuff where kids were playing doctor. It was very innocent, but they were, they were, and I'm paying these people, <laughs> readers. And mm -hmm. I'm like, we're, we're going to abridge it. So you don't want to bleed again for the reader. I understand that there's no formula, but it, it can be therapeutic. If you change the narrative, change the met, change it to something else. No, it's not about reliving the pain over and over again. I understand that, but. Part, there, there were a lot of people that told me, you know, why it, I don't want to offend people and I don't like reading to be tough, but anything I, you know, there are feel good books and there are happy books and there are comic books like the cat who mysteries. Okay. I love it. I, you know, it depends what you're in the mood for, but there are times when you, you have to be the one that decides that. And, and I understand you don't want to bleed over and over again for the reader. Um, I get that, but it's like, if you bleed once properly, I, and, I, and there's no formula, it, you get it out of your system. It's like in my second book, I had an issue with this bad o &M instructor, and I turned her into an evil alien. I bled it out once to the reader, and it's out of my system. I don't know. I can't give you a formula, but you, you definitely don't want to relive something and not not resolve it. I think as a Good writer, what you, have to, what you have to try to do is say, and that's your choice. I mean, no, writers don't have to write about pain. You know, like I said, there's a lot of happy, light stuff out there to read. I, I, I enjoy that too. It, it's really a decision. It's like, but you definitely don't want to get caught up in this bleeding over and over again. That it, it has to be more about telling your story and telling it once because it's not an over and over again thing. That's for the readers, a thousand readers. Hopefully, if you're a bestseller, they can do it over and over again. But 
you you have to find that solution and that's there's no no writer can tell you how to do that is it autobiography some people can do that is is it you fix it. for me and this is only for me you know i don't have a formula I, when i fictionalize things i turn these characters into heroes i turn them into villains and it's cathartic as they used to say in the old literary classics it's it makes you feel good or it gets it out of your system so but there's no formula and definitely you don't have to do that and suffer over and over again and i know other people are going to always judge it you know my 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 sister was a big one you know having a big sister she's like well what are your aunts and uncles going to think well they bought my second book and it's like well you said your uncle was an alcoholic i said no i didn't say that i said my mother thought he drank too much everyone knew he was an alcoholic but pe people are going to read you know no matter what you do you're going to get criticized for mm -hmm. good or bad and it it's a choice and no you you have to decide that pain level and what you really want to put out there and there's there's no right or wrong answers and it, it, me as a writer i get out of my system and it's on paper say like, oh, i'm done she's an evil alien i'm moving on to my next story carla hayes Hello. Um, I'm really enjoying this discussion, and I'm hoping at the end you'll give the Bard book numbers if you have them. But um, my question is, I, I like to experiment with, I like to write science fiction as well, and I read science fiction. And my question is, there has to be a bridge from the, just the totally out there with worlds that nobody identifies with versus the worlds that are a little bit more believable and that people can identify with. And my question is, how do you build that bridge? And how much do you have to know as far as the, um, you know, the technical information, the scientific information to build your worlds, to make them believable, but, you know, um, not so out there that nobody can identify with them. I know that sounds like a difficult question, but when I'm writing science fiction, it's something that I struggle with because some is just so out there that you can't identify with it, if you know what I mean. But on the other hand, you have to make it believable by making it scientifically credible. So that's what I'm asking. I hope you understand my question. Uh, absolutely. Um, the classics, Philip K. Dick, Arthur C. Clarke, um, Ray Bradbury, Robert Heinlein, those, it doesn't have to be that technical. It can be. I'm uh, Asimov, he, he can get very technical. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoy that as a sci-fi reader, but some of his work is very, because he, but he's written so many books and it, the average reader is going to be like that. That's way too scientific. So in my books, I, I try not, you, you have to have some of it there. It's saying like, why is the planet has a dark blue sky or because there's volcanoes, but I don't think you have to get really that technical. You you want to have it somewhat believable. I would just say read different authors. And you're right. Some of it is so far out there. And some of it is so technical. It's like, I'm a sci-fi geek, so I'm going to be like, oh, yeah, this is great. But the average person is like, I don't understand quarks. And I don't understand. So is your goal for a larger audience? And I think science fiction has become more... I want to say tone. I mean, Lost in Space, they didn't. I mean, that's more fantasy slash sci And then now the line is blurred too. Fantasy slash sci-fi. And then, of course, Star Trek. And they, at the end of the day, it was just the characters. So, yeah, I, I definitely get it. I think it depends really if you want to. Do you want to be a more geeky sci-fi where you can really get into the science of all kinds of stuff? Or do you want it to be, you know, there, there's so many lines there. And. I I I definitely understand the question. Believability, yeah, you have. I think if you, you have to just basically say, is this fantasy or science? But you don't have to write a paper on it. You know, like in my books, I I kind of just explain. Okay, this is what happened. This world had volcanoes. That's why they have purple skies because there's a lot of dust in the sky. But I don't really get into that many specifics. It it's hard. It's it's not an easy balance. I think it depends on the goal. But if, if you are going to call yourself a science fiction author, you, you have to have some basic understanding of science. With, and then it's like, do you really want to have your audience? Do you want your audience overwhelmed? I mean, and there are audiences. Like I said, I, I, I can read some of the Asimov geeky stuff, but it's very, very deep. Oh, I think that's a good response, Stephen. 
that that reading a variety of science fiction authors is important. The classics other, that I, Stephen I, has mentioned are, tend to be very heavy science explanations. And now we're seeing a, a movement from that. Some are doing that, but others are just sprinkling the science in, Carla. So there's a consistency that needs to be there and yeah. a explanation that needs to be there. But it doesn't need to be overwhelming amount of science that you see in like Asimov and Bradbury and Clark and and all. So I, I think that's a great answer. Thank you, Stephen. And next we have Amy. Hi. Everyone has choice in what they're going to read and everyone will have an opinion and you are not responsible for their thought process. I have a partner who writes thrillers and he also does a little bit of sci-fi. But because that happens doesn't mean that he's that type of person because he's nowhere near, you know, the murderer that he can write about. That's purely imagination. And even if it does, you're writing things close to home, so to speak, people have choice to read. We live in that free country of, of choice. I, I choose to write on the happier side myself. I can't write sci-fi because I, I shouldn't say I can't. I haven't delved into that, but I think that's an awesome thing when you can go there and write the background of sci-fi and cover all your bases of why their environment is the way it is and explaining why things are the way they are. Kudos to you. Thanks. I, you're right. It's all about choice. If, if I was going to worry about who was going to want to read it, I, I might never write. It's like, is it one person who's going to read it? But yeah, it's all about choice. And it's all, it's like, to me, I, I love poetry from time to time, but it's not so much that I have to say, I'm going to be a poet. I just can't picture myself being a poet. So everyone has their abilities and it's choice in what you read. And I think as writers too, it's choices of what do we want to write? Know what your heart tells you to write. And yeah, opinions. Yeah. You know, we, we all know that. Stephen, uh, very often our participants are interested in the process of the author. What is your process? How do you go about doing your writing? Do you do character sketches? Do you do outlines? Do you do a uh, character sketch of the setting and the uh, environment? What's, what sort of process do you have? I do a lot of ruminating. I don't have outlines. I don't have, I mean, I, like when my, I did my fourth book, I knew where it was going to end. And all my books were done differently. My first book kind of went in order. My second book kind of, but I don't, but my fourth book was weird because I like, I knew what the ending was going to be and I won't give it away, but it was like, you know, a dramatic, you know, spoiler alert. And I had the beginning and I actually had a chapter. And for me, and they say, what are you, you're right. What are you doing? You're just sitting there. You're not doing anything. I'm thinking. Oh, you're mm. watching TV. I'm listening to music, and people would be like, "Oh, you're, you're just lazy." It's like, my mind is is a whirlwind, and I don't have a formal. But that's my every writer's process. Some people do outlines. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not going to knock that. I think if that's going to help you, I mean, I do it mentally. I suppose. I mean, mm -hmm. at some point, but I don't have a, a formula. But I do obviously have an idea. Like the first book was like, okay, aliens discovered earth and then i never thought i'd write the sequel to the second one or the third one and when i did the third one i said oh really you're gonna do a time travel book i never <laughs> envisioned i'd be doing that and but i but i did say i'm putting this to bed this is the end of the mentons the Metton story and my fourth book was like and it was just an idea i didn't i was like i'm gonna write about android and writers criticize the writers either think they're great or they're off, they beat themselves up. It's like, oh, is this only um, novella? I mean, I still wrote it, but I was like, it should be longer. But, you know, it it was what it was. And it's like, I actually wrote about the Android. I don't have any thoughts from my fifth book. My process is a lot of ruminate. I read, I, I might read a um, Mary Higgins Clark book, or I might I, I might read a, com a comical book. It just tickles my mind. And it's like, oh, I might pick out something that is off, totally off the wall and said, use that. As, and like when I did the Android thing, it was, I heard something on the news and I said, oh, what if, 
what if um, mm-hmm. this and what if that? I, I always do the what ifs. You're going to be like a child sometimes. It depends what you're writing. Autobiographies are kind of like, you know, a little different. But any fiction is like imagining what ifs. Excellent. Excellent. I, th- I think you articulate very well a, a process that's open-ended and developmental that you're uh, over time. And I'm looking forward to seeing more from you. And, you know, your point about the novella, you know, if it was a novella, it's a novella. And thank you for not dragging us through 20 chapters when it didn't need to be, you know, or 40 That's chapters. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. and how many people are bold enough to say it's finished? You know, yes. it's the starting my third book. You know, we had every, everyone thinks, oh, COVID, you didn't give you time to write, but that was not a normal, you know, I, you mm. would have thought COVID and we're all quarantined. I didn't hardly do any writing during COVID. It, it just was, my mind just couldn't get over that. So, mm-hmm. but I figured, oh, we're, we're, we're all under quarantine. I'm going to finish this third book like in no time, but it didn't happen. You got to stop beating yourself up as writers and say, you know, the process, some, some, some authors took years to do books and, and we're not all Stephen King. And I, I wonder who doesn't have ghost writers or not, but that doesn't matter. We, we can't all write or Asimov hundreds and hundreds of books. If you can do one, it, you know, that, that's really a goal. It's like, I think, I think a lot of writers are like, well, I got to, you don't compare yourself to anyone else. Exactly. Go ahead, Amy. I was just wondering if you um, found it easier to write your novella or if it sort of flowed for your, uh, your full novel. And that was my first question. And my second one was, if you'd ever tried to write a different genre or if you're strict, strictly a sci-fi. I didn't really go into, I was, I guess I was assuming, and it's funny because my first book is the longest of my books and the other two are, you know, short and all, you know, they're, they're novels, but on that short side, or I guess it all depends how you define, you know, there's different word counts, they're novels. I didn't think of it as a novella and I just kind of just when I was done, I was like, well, I guess it's a novella. So it wasn't really, I guess some writers can say that I'm going to write a novella, but I, I guess my assumption was it's going to be another novel. So it wasn't easier necessarily, but it's funny because I I guess it's some experience. It's like, okay, I've, I've kind of written, so I'm just going to write this. And I was like, okay, I'm done. I think it, every project is different. So I said, okay, it's a novella, fine. I did, so it wasn't really a plan. And as far as other mm-hmm. genres, I thought about it. I, I think I could probably, I've thought of writing a murder mystery. I, I don't know. I definitely don't want to get into that epic poetry thing, but I, I, I admire <laughs> those writers so much. It's like, and, and then they have notes on the notes and scholarly notes. How do they write like that? <laughs> And I'm sitting there reading and say, oh, this is nice imagery. And I'm reading about, you know, the stars and the heavens and the imagery. And then they talk about how it's related to the Bible and Milton. It's like, how, how can you do that? That's mm-hmm. a, one goal. I don't, I wouldn't even know where to start, but I probably, I could probably write other genres, a Western or uh, I guess everyone wants to write a murder mystery, you know, that Agatha Christie kind of thing, but there's another thing. Some of these writers are just like, how do they do that? Kind of awe, you get that awe thing. And I, I've thought about it. I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I would definitely be open to, like I said, any anything but epic poetry. <laughs> <laughs> and we are all in awe of you, Stephen, really. we This is just wonderful. Um, I don't know if you can stick around for a little bit or not, but yeah. we got to sh- close up for the stream. Um, can you tell everyone, please, how they can reach you and find your books? Yeah, if you go on, um, it's DLD, Delta Lima Delta Books, period, C-O-M, DLDbooks.com, forward slash Stephen, that's S-T-E-P-H-E-N, no spaces, and then T-H-E-B-E-R-G-E. So it's DLDbooks dldbooks.com forward slash Stephen Thieber is my first and last name with no spaces. That'll bring you to all the different options. 
And we will have it up on our website and it will remind people also. Uh, and I do want to remind everyone for anyone who was on with us when we had Sandy Kimmel on her pod, the podcast is now live. It went live on Sunday. Listen to the podcast. She, she was kind enough to re-record all of her answers to, for us, wow. our, our questions and all of yours. I highly recommend listening to it. She had <laughs> technical issues. So the quality, yes. it was really oh. hard to hear her that yes. day. I want to give you the prompts for next week. Next week, the next time we're together is next week. And the prompt is thunderstorm, thunderstorm, Ooh. 100 words or less. Thank you. Go ahead, Kath. Thank you, everybody, for being with us for this show. We're so pleased that Stephen was with us. And thank you for our participants who shared their questions with us. For these show notes and additional resources, please visit www.writingworkswonders.com. Thank you for joining us today on Writing Works Wonders. Kathy and I are thrilled to spend time with you. A tap on that button that says subscribe so you will not miss our show. You can also tap on the link for writingworkswonders.com. It'll take you directly to all the show notes and information that we shared today. Then you can sign up to receive the Zoom link so that you can be live with us when we are recording. You can also contact us at info at writingworkswonders.com. Our phone number is 347 347- Four six seven zero two two one. We also have a donate button. All donations go to technical expenses that Kathy and I incur in order to keep this podcast going. Kathy and I want you to feel encouraged and inspired and know the wonder in writing. And until next time, our friends, keep on writing. Opinions expressed on ACB Media are those of the respective program contributors and do not necessarily reflect the views held by the American Council of the Blind, its elected officials, or its staff.